Pet Life Radio. This is Pet Life Radio. Let's talk pets. Welcome to Animal Rights on Pet Life Radio. Uh, this is your host, Tim Link. I'm super duper excited about today's show. I'm always excited. You know, if you've listened to the show over the many years we've been on, I'm always excited. But I always like unique authors. I like uh, unique stories and obviously uh, unique books that are coming out. And so I'm really excited today to talk to uh, Sergeant Mark Tappan. Sergeant uh, Mark Tappan, he is the uh, Sergeant for the Alpharetta Police Department, which is right near my neck of the woods. So I'm excited about that. It's good to have his name just in case I'm getting any trouble. But we're going to talk to him about his book, which is uh, Dog Name Max and uh, 12 Lessons for Living Courageously, Serving Selflessly, and Building Bridges from a Heroic Canine Officer. So it's super. I love that. So everybody hang tight. We'll come back right after this commercial break. And we'll start our conversation with Sergeant Mark Tappan. You're listening to Animal Rights on Pet Life Radio. Take a bite out of your competition. Advertise your business with an ad in Pet Life Radio podcasts and radio shows. There is no other pet related media that is as large and reaches more pet parents and pet lovers than Pet Life Radio. With over 7 million monthly listeners, Pet Life Radio podcasts are available on all major podcast platforms. And our live radio stream goes out to over 250 million subscribers on iHeartRadio, Odyssey, TuneIn, and other streaming apps. For more information on how you can advertise on the number one pet podcast and radio network, visit PetLifeRadio.com slash advertise today. Let's Talk Pets on PetLifeRadio.com. Welcome back to Animal Rights on Pet Life Radio. Uh, Join us now. He is the sergeant for the Alpharetta, Georgia Police Department. He's a youth pastor and, of course, the author of the latest book, A Dog Named Mattis, 12 Lessons for Living Courageously, Serving Selflessly, and Building Bridges from a Heroic Canine Officer. Sergeant Mark, welcome to the show. Thanks, Tim. Appreciate it. Glad to be here. Uh, we're super excited to have you on, and I was uh, I was telling you off air. I'll give big kudos to my wife uh, Kim. She saw you on the local news and said, "Hey, this is right up your alley. He's right in our backyard, and a stone's throw away. Perfect story about dogs. Great guy, doing great stuff. Get him on there." And she harassed me until I, I'll blame your publicist on this. She harassed me until I finally got through saying, "I need him on my show. I need him on my show." So you're on the show. So congratulations, and thank you for being on the show. <laughs> Thanks to your wife for that. I really appreciate it. <laughs> Super. So tell us first a little bit about, about the book, A Dog Named Mattis, and then tell us a little bit about how it you know sort of all came about and what made you put the, uh, the story into uh, a book. Oh, man. Well, it's been a long time coming. It, basically, I got partnered with this amazing dog, and I have been blown away with him since the second I selected him. And I wanted to be able to tell his story. And I I wrote some kids books as well that are out there. But it was really some people in my life believing in me and pushing me to write the adult book that we now have where I really didn't think I could. I'm a former Marine, you know, and we're not necessarily known as intelligence (laughs) as one of our strong suits. Oh, now. (laughs) I (laughs) was... I'm a college dropout. Like, you know, I went back and finished it later, but there's so many things that I felt like stacked against me. So, but like I said, there's some people, my publicist, the uh, publisher, and then I had some friends that just really encouraged me to put it forward. And I'm so proud of what came out. And then I get to tell a story about an amazing dog. Yeah. Well, tell us about Mattis, the amazing dog. And and I want to know about a little bit more about the uh, selection process also, how that went about. Yeah, well, he's a humongous German Shepherd, and if you know me, I'm a short guy, and I did not want a humongous German Shepherd. He's my second police dog, and I actually, to tie in the the selection process, when I went to pick him out, I wanted a 60-pound Belgian Malinois, because I went to the trainer school months prior to selecting Mattis, and when I went to the trainer school, that's what my lead trainer, he had a Belgian Malinois named Abby, and she was calm, fierce, intelligent just an amazing dog. And so I was like, that's the kind of dog that I want. And so I had all these that we went to a kennel um, out in Alabama that trains police dogs. And they were showing me all these different dogs. And and they had one dog that was just in the back. And they're like, hey, we want to get this dog out. He's not a police dog. 
He was supposed to be a personal protection dog. The buyer backed out. So let's, you know, I just want to get him out and exercise him. And I'm like, okay, yeah, that's fine. And he gets out of the car and he's a hundred pound German Shepherd. And I'm like, oh, he's beautiful, but no, that's not the dog for me. And then I started doing all my tests that I do, just you know, like testing prey drive, hunt drive, perseverance, all these different things. And he was just at the top of every single thing that I did. And uh, the final test that we actually do is we put on the bite jacket and you test the dogs like on a passive bite where you're just kind of standing there if the dog goes in and how confident they are on certain surfaces. And I went through 12 different dogs and then Mattis came in. And you got to know, like, especially if your audience is familiar with dogs and dog training, when you get them into an environment where they do their most favorite thing, anxiety builds and they start going nuts and they can barely control themselves. They're barking like crazy. And then Mattis walks in and he's calm and he's just looking around and he's focused. And then he bites me harder than ever I've ever been bitten <laughs> And I was like, this is the dog for me. Like there was something behind those eyes. It was an incredible brain that I am so glad I got to peek into a little bit that day. And I'm like, that's the dog that I want. I love that. You know, I, I always tell stories about, or not stories, but real life instances, because I'm, I'm a firm believer that everything's meant to be. For, there's a reason for everything. And I also believe that when it comes to dogs and animals in particular, that we don't go out and find them. They find us. Whether we're talking about, you know, a, a rescue or whether we're talking about one shows up at our doorstep, a friend leaves one behind, or in this case, a, a trained dog uh, trained to guard and protect these type of things. I always love the fact that we go in with sort of as humans, <laughs> yeah. you know, we go in with the thought, okay, this is what I want. You know, this is what I'm looking for. And then inevitably it turns out the opposite and it always ends up being a, uh, a plus in the end because yep. I think uh, the universe as well as the dogs know exactly what's meant to be. Yeah, and that's exactly how I feel about Mattis was he was always supposed to be my dog. So the process then with that, okay, so uh, he fools you. He ends up being much more than you ever anticipated in a very positive way. Now you guys are starting to work together and to live together. So how does that transpire? How's that? Is it a quick, easy adaption because you guys were meant to be? Or is it uh, a little bit of more uh, work behind it? And then the second question I'll throw out there automatically because my, my brain's going a thousand miles an hour here. Uh, the second question is, how do you expand on that? Now, all of a sudden, we've got a dog who's trained to do his work, but now doing much more than that and touching uh, people's lives and changing yeah. people's lives. Well, that was kind of the thing that set him apart too, was like, he was this happy, social, confident dog. Like people a lot of times think that in police dogs, you want like a dog that's on the edge, like angry or whatever, so that they can do the protection work. But the best thing about him is that he's just, he's happy and in, believes he's in control of any situation. Like he's actually apprehended suspects. Most of the suspects he apprehended and his tail was wagging the entire time. It was never like a, a scared thing or a defensive type thing. It was, this is the best game in the world. And so he always had that going for him. So the transition into the house was extremely easy. I had a one-year-old daughter at the time and I trusted him implicitly around her. So I'm extremely big because when I looked at my trainer and I looked at the private sector of these people who train dogs the exact same way that the police do, they have those dogs involved in their everyday life. And a lot of times police have the, the mentality where it's just a tool and it gets put away and only used as a tool and the handler is the only one that interacts. And from a, a dog training perspective, you know that that's, that's a recipe to make your dog antisocial and that's going to, that's actually going to cause problems. And so that's where I took the different approach of, no, let's socialize him to everything that I possibly can so that he's just confident in any situation he goes into. So he already had a great foundation of being happy, confident, social from the start. Now, how does he take that and expand that to the masses? Because obviously for us, uh, you know, novices out here, we think, okay, uh, uh, you're teamed up with a, a partner, you know, you're teamed up with a dog partner and you uh, do your work and you live your lives together. And then somewhere down the road, there's retirement or something going on. But I know with Mattis, it was even more than that from the get go. Yeah. I always saw the canine position in before Mattis. I saw it this way as well with my first dog is that we had a threefold job and one was to be excellent in the training that we did. And I think 
like I had experienced prior some of not the best training, right? That we didn't hold ourselves to the highest level. I want to be excellent in the deployments that we make good decisions and use the dogs when we're supposed to and don't use them when we're not supposed to. And then the third area, and this was the the key is I wanted to be excellent community relations because I saw the bridge that dogs immediately create. Like if you just go to the park, if you show up with a dog, people are interested. If you show up with a police dog, they are so inquisitive because of the amazing things that these dogs do. And I think a lot of times, you know, we'll have the do not pet stickers on them or patches and where there could be a bridge, it immediately shuts that down when someone says, can I pet your dog? Nope, he's working. And so I was like, well, if I'm not actively tracking someone or I'm not actively fighting, so like who would ask during those things anyway, but why not? Like, yeah, absolutely. And then start answering questions about the dog. So I always saw it as threefold. Like I said, in the third part of that was be excellent in community relations. And I tried to take that as far as I could with reaching as many people as I could with social media. And then, you know, we had some opportunities that came up through that, like the book and being on some TV shows and whatnot. And I think it's amazing because you're absolutely right. Uh, Animals, we'll say in general, but dogs for sure, since they're out, we're out and about with them quite often. They are the great common denominator. You know, they break down the walls because everybody's either had a dog or has a dog or has had some sort of relationship relationship with a dog. And I love the fact that, you know, this is a golden opportunity and you saw that perfectly. Golden opportunity, do some community outreach and people to learn and trust and trust you and the dog and the and the police in general, because, uh, you know, oftentimes, you know, outsider looking in, it's either uh, we have a distant relationship with the police unless we need them, or there's those opportunities where it's almost like you have to go you know, almost feels like, okay, that here's a, here's a, uh, a fair that's going on or some sort of community involvement thing that you have to do. And you took it the opposite way. You said, Hey, this was a great opportunity. you got a great, uh, uh, companion there that uh, knows how to work with people and, uh, understand. And I'm sure that, uh, people learned not only about Mattis, but also about, uh, the great work that you guys do. Yeah. That, that's what we were hoping for. Yeah. I think it's fantastic. So then when we talk about how this comes about as far as the book, and I'm going to ask you uh, after the break a little bit about writing the book and how it parlayed into uh, from a children's book to a an adult, we'll say adult book. Um, but when you had all these great stories and all these great experiences, I know that you wanted to expand it, or I'm, I believe that you wanted to expand it even further as far as the book is concerned. There was more than just a book. This is more than just a book about uh, a canine officer and a, a sergeant going and doing these jobs. Yes, it has the great car chases and all the great stories and stuff, but you, uh, I believe, wanted to take it a little bit step further. Oh, absolutely. The funniest thing is, is it's from the most simple action of my dog. And he did it every day that we went to work. That was, it was so encouraging to me was I would wake up in the morning and anyone who wakes up, especially we wake up super early in the morning to go to work. And my dog, he knew that we were going to work and he would, he would lightning bolt down the stairs and run to his harness and do circles waiting to go to work and his tail would wag. And once I got that harness on him, he would bolt to the front door and just wait in anticipation while I got all my stuff. And he would do his little steppy steps, you know, where he just shipped him weight from back and forth from one foot to another, just waiting for me to crack the door so he could head straight for the car. And I saw that in my dog and I'm like, man, that's, that's amazing. If I could approach life the same way that my dog does, Right. He is so excited because he knows that we're going to go to work. He's going to do something that he loves and he's going to be with me. And that, like, that is his world. And what it broke down in my mind was I have this amazing life with a family that I love and I get to do a job that I love with my best friend, a dog. And why can't I approach everything I do with the same tenacity that my dog does? And so it was kind of cool. And that's where the book grew was it's seeing these amazing qualities um, in the dog that make me want to be a better person. And so that's kind of how the book is. It, my hope is, is that people will be able to take their own circumstances and do the exact same, is, right? Is be encouraged by just the things around them and see the things that you can learn and grow from. 
Yeah, I think it's brilliant. I think it's ha- uh, brilliant how you put it all together in uh, in the uh, subtitle, A Dog Named Mattis, 12 Lessons for Living Courageously. Now, how did you come up with 12 lessons? I'm sure there's full of lessons. And I will say, I'll give you a big kudos for this as well. Oftentimes, we live our life with these wonderful companions of ours, whether they're in our professional life, personal life, whatever it may be. And we don't often stop to see the lessons that they're teaching us on a daily basis. It's usually after they've made, oftentimes after they made their transition that we step back and reflect and think, oh, wow, that, you know, this dog was teaching me some, some amazing things. You recognized it early and then how'd you sort of boil it down to just the 12 lessons? Well, a lot of it was my, my publishing agent, right? And as we were talking about the arc and, you know, every story needs an arc and they're like, tell about the arc of Mattis. And I'm like, it's really not, it's not the arc of Mattis. Like as I sat down and I started thinking about all this, the things that we went on and what I realized, it's my arc. Like he was there from the beginning. He's been an excellent dog. And I poured into him and I think we, we grew as a team um, and did some great things together. But it was really from me learning. And I think that's a lot of what dog handling and training is, is like everything that a dog does in police work, they know how to do. They're experts in. The key is me learning to interpret what he's trying to tell me. And try to get him to do what I want. And so that's where the art came from. And as I sat there and thought about all the things that we had done together, that's where the 12 lessons came from. It was it was one of those that it's like, okay, this is what I learned here. This is what I learned here. This is what I learned here. Kind of framed it out. And it's like, oh, yeah, the arc's in me, not the dog. I love that. That's fantastic. And once again, Mattis is teaching you to look within yourself and learn these lessons now and so you can share them with others. So I think it's uh, brilliant on that aspect. All right. So we're going to get ready to uh, take a commercial break. Um, we'll come back after the break and talk to uh, a little bit further about uh, Sergeant Mark Tappan and the book A Dog Named Mattis. Uh, everybody hang tight. We'll be back after this commercial break. You're listening to Animal Rights on Pet Life Radio. Hi, this is Tim Link, animal communicator and pet expert and host of Animal Rights on Pet Life Radio. Have you ever wanted to know what your pet is really thinking? Do you want to find out if they truly understand what you're trying to tell them? Or wish you could build a better understanding and closer relationship with your pet? Well, now you can. Learning to communicate with animals is a four-part on-demand workshop. In the workshop, you'll learn the essential techniques that are necessary to communicate with animals, including what is animal communication, breathing correctly to achieve the perfect state to communicate with your animals at a deeper level, using guided meditation exercises and method to communicate with animals, and how to send and receive information from your animals. So if you're wanting to learn how to communicate and connect with your animals at a deeper level, visit PetLifeRadio.com forward slash workshop and purchase and download Load, learning to communicate with animals. You'll be glad you did. Let's talk pets. Let's talk pets on Pet Life Radio. Pet Life Radio. Pet Life Radio. Dot com. Welcome back to Animal Rights on Pet Life Radio. Continue our conversation with uh, author and sergeant of the Alpharetta Police Department. Sergeant Mark Tappan in his book, A Dog Named Mattis, 12 Lessons for Living Courageously, Serving Selflessly, and Building Bridges from a Heroic Canine Officer. So I have to ask, Sergeant Mark, right now, I I know everybody's listening. It's like, okay, Tim, you babbled on long enough. Tell us about Mattis. What's life with Mattis? And and how's Mattis? We heard about all the fun stuff that's going on. Uh, What's a daily life like right now? Well, now he is retired. So he retired in 2021. Some signs of age are starting to show. He's not quite as fast as he used to be. Um, He's still always by my side if I'm home. The biggest transition really was when the first day after I left for work without him, and he didn't understand that, and it was for about six months he'd he'd do the same thing, was he would run down to where his harnesses were, and he'd run in circles, and then I wouldn't put his harness on, and then he'd walk me to the front door, and he would look at me confused, and it would break my heart every day for six and then i'd go out and i do the job and then he's by the door when i come home now it's gotten to the point where okay he knows he's not he doesn't get to go to work anymore but he's the only dog that wakes up with me in the morning he walks to the top of the stairs with me and um he says his goodbyes to me and then i go down and get uh, finished getting ready and head out the door 
And once again, as soon as I get home, he's always by my side. Right now during the interview, he's he's laying in front of me, just making sure that I'm safe. So his life's a little bit different. We get the opportunity now that with the book and the kids' books and social media and all this other stuff that we've done is to make appearances every once in a while, do charity functions, speaking every once in a while. So that's what we do. And then I try to, as much as I can, still engage his brain as much as possible. Because often when working dogs retire, they don't live much longer because they lose their purpose. And so I wanted to make sure that with him, he always had a purpose. And then every day we play some kind of game that involves his nose and his brain. Uh, and we do it together. I love that. I love that because I'm a big proponent of mental and physical stimulation, especially with our dogs. So I think that's a big part of it. And I look at this as, yes, I can't imagine actually those six months, even though you're telling him and I know he understands, oh, that's, that had to be brutal. But now he's serving, a, continuing to serve, continuing to serve the, the community, continuing to serve in just, just in a little bit different way. Yeah, he does. He does some good work. Absolutely. Absolutely. So let's talk about the writing process in general. So we, you came out with a fabulous children's book. First of all, how did you say, okay, I need to get the story out there, but I'm going to write a children's book? Because I know the audience that's listening that are writers, they know that it, you know children's books aren't that easy. You know, it's not like write you know ten pages and slap some nice illustrations in there and you're done. They actually can be uh, much harder than writing a uh, a little memoir. Yeah, well, so it started off with why I started just jotting down some notes of what I wanted to write a book about um, and tell Madison's story. And then I was trying to explain to my uh, six-year-old daughter at the time what I was doing. And so uh, she's like, what are you writing about? I said, Mattis. And she's like, tell me about it. And so I had to take his stories and put it into a language that she would understand. And um, I saw her get really emotional. And like she knew all the stories and knew that he was still with us. But I saw how it moved her. And so that kind of inspired me. It's like, maybe I can start here with a children's book, especially I think that's a little more on my level um, <laughs> as I started on that. Because like, quite honestly, the adult book was daunting to me. Like I, I, I didn't know like if I would be capable of doing that. Not that the children's book, like you said, was any easier, but I, I had immediate feedback from my daughter that it could have an impact. Brilliant. I think that's brilliant because obviously uh, if you can't sell her on it, you might as well just hang up the children's <laughs> book. Forget about the you know the regular novel. You're not going to sell the kids and you got to get it accurate because they'll call you on it. That's for sure. Oh, definitely. That's the truth. <laughs> so we go from the book Canine Mattis on the Job, A Day in the Life of a Police Dog, wonderfully illustrated by uh, Donald Wu. Uh, I, you know, I just lo love the cover design on it as well. And uh, so we go from that. And we say, okay, we've had some success with that. That's reaching an audience, a, a young audience, which is fantastic because they need to know about dogs and they need to know about our wonderful police officers and the jobs that are done by both. Now, what's the epiphany? Did the publisher contact you said, we must have a memoir on this whole thing? Or was it, uh, <laughs> okay, I did that when I'm done with the children's book. <laughs> let's, let's consider the other one, but let's give it some time. Yeah, so I actually self-published two kids' books before Ken and Mattis on the job. So the very first kids' book was a dog named Mattis, and I, I put it on Amazon, and it just, people bought it in droves, which was really cool. And so when I signed with Thomas Nelson, it was actually for a children's book, and that's what initially I was pursuing only a children's book. And uh, but that's where my publishing agent pushed me, and she said, like, no, you need to you need this story. And that's why I'm blown away by this entire thing is Thomas Nelson took on a, a first time author that had never written a book before. And I didn't have a manuscript. I had an outline of what I get the 12 lessons and that's it. And they took a huge chance on me. The process was incredible. And that was the other stupid thing that I did. They asked me if I wanted a ghostwriter and I'm like, no, I really want to tell this in my own voice. And they gave me the best editor, uh, Brigitte Nortker, who helped me through the entire process and probably, you know, she beat me over the head with the Oxford comma until I embraced it. <laughs> you know, but once the book was done, I'm, I'm done with that Oxford comma. <laughs> but she was, she was so good in the process. It was better than I thought it could be. Like I enjoyed it so much. I would every day. Uh, usually a couple days a week, I would go to a, a coffee shop, probably might've seen you walking through. <laughs> you probably did. Uh, 
but with headphones on and I, I dove into memories in the world of what Mattis taught me and I loved every second of it and something, you know, I'm, I'm pretty proud of came out of it. So. Absolutely. You should be proud of it for sure. You and Mattis both should be proud of it and the story and, and all you've accomplished. And uh, I love the fact that it's like, no, if, I, if I'm going to do this, I don't, I don't need a ghostwriter. You know, who knows Mattis, who knows the story better than you do? You know what I mean? Right. So I love that. Like I said, my voice was important to me. Absolutely. Absolutely. And you did a great job with it. So uh, give yourself a big pat on the back on, on, the, on the book and, uh, and we'll say a great job by the, the publishing house and editors and uh, agency for recognizing all that too. So I think it's fantastic. I am grateful for them. So now that uh, now that you got the uh, the memoir, and we've got an audio book too, so we have to mention that. So we've got the audio book, and it's narrated by this this wonderful voice, uh, just very very happy go lucky, very uh, charming voice. Uh, I'm not sure who you got to do the audio book. <laughs> well, thank you. You know, like I don't know if you're a professional and do this all the time. Maybe you like the sound of your own voice, but uh... <laughs> people would say so. Yeah, people would say that quite often about me. Actually, <laughs> that's awesome. Well, yeah. So you're like like me. I'm not sure that I was the best for it, but I did it, and you get to hear my emotion in the audio book because there there's definitely emotional parts of the book. That's it. And you know, audio books are you know each one of these you know is a challenge. You know, uh, writing a children's book and illustrating it or having someone illustrate it that understands what you're trying to the message you're trying to get out there and the history and the feelings behind it. Challenging. Then you put it in a memoir that's uh, you know geared towards the masses. Another challenge. And then audiobooks, you know, people think, okay, well, all you're doing is, you know, sitting behind a microphone and reading. Well, if all you're doing is sitting behind a microphone and reading, it's not going to be an entertaining audiobook. And right. people are going to, you know, turn it off as soon as they turn it back, you know, it started up. So, you know, having your voice, feeling your emotions and letting it all come through, they can feel that and they, and they know, uh, know that, uh, you know, hey, this is a pretty exciting story. Yeah, it was a fun process. So now the book's out, the audio book's out, we're, we're out there, we're doing the good work, the message is out there. Mattis understands uh, the new role, getting the message out there. What's the next thing? What's, what's the next uh, purpose, mission? Do we have another book in the wings? Uh, what are we looking at? Yeah, I, I think the biggest realization that I, I learned from it all is, you know, he's got a great story, but every handler has great stories. And so I would like to just give a platform to different handlers and the dogs that they have and just highlight the amazing work that's going on out there and the the things that the dogs teach us. There's, you know, a, more heroic dogs than my dog uh, that have done incredible things. And I'd love to tell those stories. So that might be an area of focus in the future. We'll see. There you go. We like it. We like it. And put us first on the list when you get all that done so you can come back on the show. Definitely. So where can people find out more about uh, you and Mattis and uh, the events and all the activities going on? Uh, MyDogMattis.com is probably the best place to go. Is That's our website. You can find it there. If you look up Mattis, M-A-T-T-I-S on Instagram or TikTok, we're on both of those and have a pretty significant following. And you can kind of see the shenanigans that we get involved with on a daily basis. Love it. Love it. We'll get that out there and get that posted so everybody knows. Definitely go out and follow all of the uh, wonderful things you guys are doing together. And everybody pick up a copy of the book. It's a uh, dog named Mattis. Well, lessons for living courageously, serving selflessly, and building bridges from a heroic canine officer by Sergeant Mark Tappan. Sergeant Mark, as I'll continue to call you, thanks so much. Congratulations on uh, a great work. Please do give Mattis a big hug from me. And uh, we'll look forward to chatting with you again somewhere down the road. Love it, Tim. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Absolutely. Well, we're uh, coming to the end of the show today. I want to thank everyone for listening to Animal Rights on Pet Life Radio. I want to thank the uh, producers and sponsors for making this show possible. Uh, if you have any questions, comments, ideas for the show, uh, drop us a line. You can go to PetLifeRadio.com, and we'll be glad to answer your questions, entertain your comments, and bring on the people you want to hear from most. And while you're there, check out all the other wonderful uh, shows and hosts. It's a uh, cornucopia of animal fun. It's at PetLifeRadio.com. So until next time, write a great story about the animals in your life, and who knows, you may be the next guest on Animal Rights on Pet Life Radio. Have a great day. Let's Talk Pets, every week on demand, only on PetLifeRadio.com.